Hello, this is uh, John Canalopoulos. It's really a pleasure to share with you some of the basic principles of current refractive cornea imaging techniques. It's a field that has uh, really advanced the last two decades. It's become a significant part of the armamentarium, not only for external disease cornea specialists, uh, anterior segment surgeons, but in ophthalmology in general, considering that visual function significantly depends on the state of the ocular surface and the refractive properties of the cornea. So we have a lot of material to cover. Let's quickly uh, go and look what's currently available and most popular. And we're talking about ophthalmology offices, ophthalmology centers, your university settings globally. The most common probably is the uh, picture here on the left, the sign fluke tomography. We're using terms topography and tomography interchangeably hopefully within this talk we'll start to differentiate the two we can see a topography from a tomography but we have to pay attention to where this topographic map has derived from and we'll discuss some of the principles and understand why is they're important so in tomography this is the sign fluke tomography represented as the most commercial variant being the pentacam and there's several stages within its evolution as well and uh, it takes sine fluke sections of the cornea that measure elevation and the data are transformed into um, curvature, thickness, etc. I don't want to preempt, we'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, the golden standard and the first topography available is the Placido based topography seen in the middle. We're all familiar with this. Uh, the Placido Myers are uh, projected onto the cornea. Uh, their image is being photographed, analyzed, and thus surface topography. Uh, just to understand the difference between topography and tomography, I'm uh, putting on the right an example of uh, also reflection topography. This is the Cassini. It's a color LED reflection topography. And we'll brush a little bit. Um, on. So on to the uh, next slide here. We're going to go back in the past and look at the uh, most popular manual curtometers available. Uh, these were used... Uh, clinically for several decades prior to the advent of uh, cornea topography. On the left is the Javal Shiach uh, keratometer and on the right the Bashan Lom. These were the most uh, popular that may be still available somewhere in the corner in your ophthalmology uh, clinic or in the storage room of your uh, ophthalmology center. And on top right we can see what the patient saw when they were evaluated with this, with a Javal keratometer, the two lighted sources, the two arrows and the uh, box or square, and the examiner had the view that's un just underneath that, the two green arrows and the red box, and adjusting the instrument to measure keratometry entailed to line up these two images. Below the uh, color green and red are the yellow, orange, and red, and you can see on the left side they're unaligned or misaligned, and on the right side they are aligned, and this alignment serves the purpose of adjusting the actual axis of the astigmatism to be measured, or keratometry to be measured, and then bringing them to touch each other, uh, similar to what we see when we look at the reticules in measuring gold man applanation, makes the amount of diapters accurate. So with the Javal, we're able to measure uh, the uh, steep and the flat axis, and these axes did not have to be perpendicular. So in oblique astigmatism, you could measure two axes, a steep and a flat, that were not necessarily 90 degrees apart. Now the Bashalam keratometer, a little bit more complicated to explain. As you can see, the reticules visualized by the examiner are this system of circles with plus and minuses and the two crosses. Uh, similar concept here, we have to align the crosses and thus rotate the instrument to find the steep axis and bring in the circles with our diopter dial to touch each other. Uh, as you can see on the uh, fourth picture on the right, uh, right side, and thus we have the steep axis and amount of keratometry, and here the flat axis is perpendicular. Um, just a brief review of these instruments. Uh, we'll jump uh, directly into placebo-based technology. Very old in its uh, uh, conception, 
uh, first uh, imaging uh, of uh, marble impressions on the cornea was described by Christopher Shiner, an astronomer and astrophysicist uh, in the 17th century, contemporary of Galilei. Uh, but it was uh, until the late 1800s that uh, Antonio Placido, a Portuguese ophthalmologist, introduced what you're seeing on the top right, which is basically the Placido disc. This handheld device had uh, a black background, circle, concentric circles painted white, and a uh, aperture, an opening in its center. So the, the, these mirrors were facing the patient, facing the patient's cornea, and the examiner was looking through that little hole uh, at the reflection of the placido discs onto the patient's cornea. And thus, uh, from their regularity and from their in-between spacing, one can ascertain whether the cornea is normal, has astigmatism, what the uh, proximate axis of that astigmatism is, even significant irregularities uh, such as keratoconus and pellucid modular degeneration can be picked up with this very simple but extremely valuable device. Uh, its uh, value was recognized by Javal, who incorporated uh, these rings in his ophthalmometer um, in the late 1800s, and um, Al Alvar Goldstrand uh, also incorporated the placido discs in uh, his uh, uh, microscope to, and was able to measure keratometry in his calculations of the ideal or model eye. And it was uh, later on in the 1950s when Wesley Jessen Company uh, used an um, oval uh, bowl uh, with uh, rings being projected in order to um, uh, correct for field de defects that a flat surface with the rings being reflected on the cornea would have. Uh, fascinating uh, and very simple initial step, but uh, the value of its outcome is tremendous. Here we're seeing uh, uh, a description in physics of how we can take a 3D model shown on the top right and translate that through contour lines in a map where the lines, as far as the proximity, can uh, designate the magnitude and gradient. So the closer the lines, the stronger the gradient. Uh, it's quite difficult to understand, but this is a principle where inter interpreting the placido disc um, image on the cornea ends up uh, giving us topography. And uh, obviously, with the advent of uh, the use of computers, these images are processed, and topography uh, can measure not actually cornea anterior curvature, but uh, the tear film curvature, and this immediately carries with it a prerequisite that the tear film is, so to speak, perfect and naive, and we understand that any tear film instability deriving from many common denominators, dry eye, blepharitis, contact lens use, even the use of acclination tonometry prior to the time that we image the eye can interfere with the accuracy of uh, the tear film and thus the measurement with the placebo-based topography. Alignment is also key. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, I want to, in this slide to go through some of the basic cornea optics terms that we'll be using, things that are important in interpreting uh, the uh, corneal diagnostics uh, metrics. Uh, obviously, the most significant optical power in the eye comes from the air tear, tear film interface. And we know uh, back from Goldstrand's uh, work in is uh, eye model that the cornea contributes uh, 43 about 43 doctors to the total power of the eye the rest being the crystalline lens of the eye and that comes from adding the 48.8 doctors that the tear uh, air interface uh, or the anterior cornea surface provides minus uh, uh, 5.8 which is the negative power of the posterior uh, surface of the cornea. And uh, these terms are used interchangeably and sometimes uh, create confusion. We'll talk about it a little bit later. I pointed out uh, here some of the key elements, standard keratomes and placido-based topographies obviously measure the anterior cornea radius of curvature and thus estimate the cornea power. Uh, the uh, Munderland formula is a very helpful formula when we're evaluating keratometry in lieu of refractive surgery, cornea refractive surgery, it's good to keep in mind 
uh, from it we can calculate the uh, preoperative keratometry if we know the postoperative keratometry and the effective refractive error corrected. Uh, the formula tells us that T equals uh, S squared multiplied by the opters of a refractive error divided by 3, T being the depth of central ablation in microns, S being the diameter of that optical, optical zone in millimeters, and D the degree of refractive correction in diopters. So the uh, keratometry postoperatively would be equal with keratometry preoperatively, and we add to that uh, just the 0 0.8 of the refractive error corrected. So if we have preoperative preoperatively 45, and we're correcting 10 diopters, 0.8 of that, of minus 10, would be minus 8. So 45, adding the minus 8, will end up with a plus 37 diopters in a post-anterior keratometry measurement. And this rule of thumb usually uh, holds true. We're seeing on the right images the Goldstrand um, Model I, and uh, we know now that it does not always hold true, but this is a good basic principle. And then the indices of uh, cornea, aqueous, uh, cortex, nucleus, and vitreous, uh, some significant parameters in optics. I will not go uh, significantly in detail in those. Um, pupillary axis is an important parameter. It's the theoretical line that joins the uh, center of the entrance pupil, so the center of the pupil, um, and uh, uh, towards which the local tangent is perpendicular. Um, so theoretically, it's the geometric center of the eye. Angle kappa is the angle between the pupillary axis and the visual axis. The visual axis being the line uh, that connects the target, the visual target, uh, and the fovea, and that line goes through the nodal points of the eye. Now, um, angle lambda is basically very similar and most of the time when we talk about angle kappa, we're referring to angle lambda, but these two are almost equal and can be used interchangeably. And um, uh, angle lambda uh, that shows us the fixation point uh, if that point is far away, uh, position and eternity, and the image is next to that. And now uh, cornea vertex is very commonly confused with cornea apex. And in an ideal scenario, those two are the same, meaning the peak of the central cornea, which is the steepest, and this is the cornea apex, usually is also the vertex. But it, when we come down in measuring corneas and visual function with great accuracy, we need to differentiate the two. Cornea vertex is the first Purkinje image of, the, um, uh, of a light being reflected on the cornea if that eye is focusing on the light and cornea apex is the steepest point of the cornea. And these two will be far apart, for instance, in keratoconus, because the steepest part of the cornea will be most likely infratemporally, and that now becomes the cornea apex, where the cornea vertex, the point on the cornea where the target light is being reflected, will be more centrally uh, to that uh, oblique keratoconus uh, cornea apex. So very important to understand the difference between the two. Uh, the cornea is not spherical, we know now, because if it was uh, a half sphere, uh, then there would be tremendous spherical aberration, and uh, color would be focused in different uh, focal points within the eye, calling, uh, uh, resulting in significant color uh, aberration. So the normal human cornea is quite prolate in its mid-periphery and its periphery, meaning it becomes flatter. We can see that example in the middle topography on the right image where the cornea looks steeper in the center and it becomes a little bit flatter. This topography shows us just the central nine millimeters of the cornea. So outside that cornea being usually 12 millimeters, it becomes even more flatter. And all this is designed uh, by nature in order to reduce spherical aberration and improve uh, focusing in the eye. Um, and uh, an oblate cornea would be a cornea that is uh, steeper than spherical and um, uh, seen on the picture uh, uh, on the right and uh, so on and so forth. Now let's go to placido based topography. Uh, it is a reflection topography as we talked about before. Here we're seeing a readout of one of the most common devices. We can see that the projected Myers uh, encounter 
almost uh, 90, 80, 90 percent of the cornea surface. This device has the ability with the dotted line to define the limbus. The other dotted line in the middle defines the pupil, and we're also seeing a cross, which is the center of the pupil, so where the pupillary axis that we talked about before should go through, and it's not the same point with the center of the uh, Placido Myers, which would be the cornea vertex, and would represent, theoretically, the point through which the visual axis in the patient goes through when they're fixating on the target. So here we're seeing angle kappa being defined in the numbers underneath the uh, Myers uh, as uh, 3.4 millimeters on the A X axis. And uh, actually that is the uh, pupillary diameter, 3.4 millimeters. And the X axis is a plus 0 0.15 uh, millimeters uh, off, uh, meaning superior. Uh, and uh, the y-axis of plus 0 0.12 millimeters, and these are 150 and 120 microns respectively, and this is a significant uh, deviation uh, uh, in angle kappa. We're seeing in the top right the end result, which is the curvature maps um, that are produced from the cornea radius measured by the spacing of the placido discs uh, being uh, imaged here and analyzed by the topography computer. Important things to point out here is that obviously the accuracy of the topography depends on the quality of the tear film, and we can elucidate uh, on that regard uh, by looking at the raw data, the Myers being reflected, and see how uh, well this image is being produced. Sometimes a shattering from the nose or eyelashes may reduce the accuracy of the measurement. Uh, this particular readout that we're seeing has uh, areas that are extrapolated on the top right, the topographic map being uh, uh, pointed out with the black dots, meaning those data are not objective data. They're extrapolated based on the rest of the cornea curvature. We can see the significant astigmatism being uh, pointed out. It's the red uh, bow tie that's almost vertical. It points towards the um, 75 degree direction, maybe closer to 80 degrees, and it's steeper and freerly, so this is an important point. Another important point is that on this particular map, the uh, cornea astigmatism is, is slightly truncated. We're going to talk about that uh, later, meaning that bow tie does not go from edge to edge. It is shorter um, in its superior aspect and longer in the inferior aspect, and this obviously would raise suspicion for keratoconus. We'll talk about that later as well. Now on the um, bottom right, we can see um, the uh, two meridians of topography being described within uh, different areas of optical zone from the center of the cornea. And then uh, again, uh, we have data on asphericity. On the bottom left, it's uh, represented here as eccentricity. Eccentricity is 0 0.62, and asphericity is the square of that with an opposite denominator. So it would be in this eye close to a minus 0 0.3 something. Um, and um, other things we can see on the bottom here is the um, white to white, which is 11.8 millimeters. And this particular measurement also has a self accuracy measurement. It gives us an 85% uh, and a green light. Uh, these The data from this topography will be used for topographic guided ablation on the Right side, we can see again um, uh, the Myers uh, photographed on the cornea that represent the raw data, the uh, produced topography, uh, a typical placido disc device. You can see the bowl configuration of the actual uh, uh, placido discs, and these are illuminated as we can see on the bottom right picture, and how the patient is actually uh, staying in place to obtain the measurement. Now, uh, we talked about the concentric rings. We talked about the, the fact that uh, the measurement starts from the first ring to the second ring, thus um, creating a little bit of a black spot in the absolute center of placido-based topography. So the center data are not actually data that are measured, but they're extrapolated. And that we always need to take into account. Um, tomography topographies give more accurate central data Placido disc topographies uh, extrapolate uh, the central data from the rest of the cornea curvature. Thus, their center 
is not an objective measurement. And we need to keep that in mind, especially when we're evaluating central cornea pathology. Um, uh, what else can we talk about here? Um, the fact that uh, topography, placido-based topography systems do not measure elevation. They measure, um, ele they reconstruct uh, elevation data based on the, the curvature measurements and sophisticated algorithms. It's the um, tear film that's important. And on the bottom right picture here, uh, we have a very nice uh, schematic uh, showing the tear film having a superficial lipid layer, the aqueous uh, uh, layer in the middle, the largest part of the tear film, the mucin layer that connects the tear film with the cornea epithelium, the cornea epithelium. So obviously any pathology interfering with tear film will interfere with the accuracy of the Placido disc-based uh, program. And on the two green-eyed images, we can see just looking at the Placido images that the uh, left one has little astigmatism, it was very regular. The uh, right blue eye image uh, shows an elongation of the Myers uh, in the horizontal meridian suggesting vertical astigmatism. Little caveat here is that even if in, in lack of Myers, if we look at a human pupil and it's really oval and elongated in one direction, it is most likely that that eye would have astigmatism in the opposite uh, or the perpendicular uh, meridian uh, because uh, that is the visual illusion that it's creating to the examiner. Again, the same picture here, uh, reviewing the Placido uh, row data, the result topography on the top um, uh, right, the pair diameter astigmatic, astigmatic data, and then the keratometries, uh, steep, flat, uh, total astigmatism, 2.3 diopters here, astigmatic uh, axis of the flat meridian being 166.3 degrees, making the steep axis 90 degrees apart. So um, uh, the steep axis will be 76.3 degrees, as we talked about before, almost 80 degrees. Eccentricity 0 0.62, making uh, the uh, Q value, let me calculate that on the fly here, uh, 0 0.62 uh, times itself uh, will give us a aspherosity for this eye uh, of a magnitude of minus 0 0.38, um, and then the Y to Y. Next slide, we're seeing examples where the regular tear film will interfere with uh, the Myers uh, of uh, them being pro uh, projected. Uh, we're seeing a, a almost perfect picture on the left, on the top middle, we're seeing um, the irregularity of the uh, Placido Myers. And again, on the bottom picture, some eyes with significant lephritis and um, uh, a significant distortion of the tear film, and thus uh, it has to be taken into account. We're also seeing some of these topographers are able to image with infrared cameras the meibomian gland uh, complex very well, and they're used accordingly. Now, as far as using topography and screening uh, for cornea regularity and irregularity, uh, there's a nice uh, publication that passed by Rabinovich showing astigmatic patterns. Uh, I will not go into detail uh, in these patterns. I will uh, just point out the most important here, which is probably the uh, fourth from the top, the inferior steepening, the one that we saw before and we pointed out, and the second from the bottom, which is the uh, uh, bow tie uh, scissoring, meaning uh, the bow tie is no more uh, in line. Uh, it is uh, skewed, and this is also a one of the first signs of irregular astigmatism, and we need to just qualitatively screen for that the first look we have of the topography. The other thing I want to point out is I added a picture of a significantly truncated uh, astigmatism this is that uh, extra picture on the uh, extreme right showing um, astigmatism that at the first look may look very regular because it's symmetric. It is in line, the bow tie is in line, but please note that it's very short, it's truncated, it doesn't reach the edges of the topography, which as we talked about before is nine millimeters. This bow tie has a um, diameter of about three to four millimeters, and this is a very significant clinical sign of a central ectasia, central keratoconus. Uh, so important thing to remember. I'll just fly a little bit through a different uh, reflection topography. This is the Cassini. You can see that it uses a septimal 
bow um, these, uh, on the far uh, left uh, and projects uh, color LEDs that are then pictured on the cornea by the device and analyzed not in a similar way with placido discs but uh, with ray tracing over every three given spots. Thus, this device claims to give more accurate central cornea data. Uh, and the central data are not extrapolated here, they're objective central data in contrast to most uh, or all placebo-based devices and more close to um, uh, cornea tomography devices. And if you note the um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven white dots reflected, these white dots are used uh, by the device to image their second Purkinje image, which is the image of the posterior surface of the cornea and thus obtain data of depth and be able to give uh, posterior cornea astigmatism and the future perhaps cornea pachymetry as well. And I'm going to use this as a, um, uh, as a prelude to going into tomography. Um, uh, right after we go through this paper we published, uh, it's almost a decade now, on looking at um, uh, naive eyes in our pre-refractive surgery patients which were group A average age 35.7 uh, years uh, and we can see on the bottom left uh, image that when measuring astigmatism in those eyes with the Cassini topographer that we just saw before uh, the rule was that most of the eyes were uh, with the rule as far as their astigmatism we can see the with the rule eyes uh, are um, almost 80 percent of the eyes and then if Looking at another uh, very uh, popular group in our practice, which is the pre cataract surgery group uh, with a mean age of uh, 73.59 years, we can see that the data here have changed. Um, this is a very large uh, uh, group of uh, patients that we studied, actually two groups of patients, 350 patients, so uh, 700 eyes. We can see that the rule here is that most of the astigmatism is against the rule showing uh, what has been described in the past that we're born uh, with the rule with slight with rule astigmatism as an average and at the um, uh, towards the end of our lifetime and through the, all the changes our body goes through the cornea astigmatism changes towards the against the rule thought you may find this interesting and this is some more parameters that came out for this uh, study looking at the repeatability Obviously, the more astigmatism uh, one eye has, the higher the repeatability because it's easier to measure high astigmatism, the less, uh, uh, the, less the repeatability. So when, comparing, when we are comparing topography devices, uh, the most difficult challenge is eyes with low astigmatism, such as eyes after refracted surgery. Um, and we can see the schematics here. I'm not going to stay into detail. Uh, just to give you an example of where posterior cornea curvature is important, here, and this is still work uh, with the Cassini that, uh, from what I described to you before, can give us posterior cornea curvature data as well through those uh, white dots and their second Purkinje image. Uh, we can see that the uh, uh, front cornea um, astigmatism is depicted with the red dotted line. And this is the astigmatism that most keratometric devices, uh, autorefractors, uh, and uh, placido-based topographers will give us as astigmatism uh, and then uh, we're seeing the um, orange finely dotted line which shows us the um, total cornea simulated in flat for the backside of the cornea and the um, uh, and the uh, total cornea sim steep with the more uh, coarse uh, orange dotted line so here there's a difference between anterior posterior keratometry and there's disagreement of the anterior keratometry to the total keratometry and obviously this has been um, pointed out by uh, significant research groups such as the one uh, by uh, Dr. Koch uh, in uh, Texas. It becomes very important when we're calculating a keratometry for the use for instance of a toric interocular lens and this is an example of uh, uh, agreement of the anterior to the total keratometry where uh, anterior and posterior keratometry are the same thus total is almost the same with the anterior so another thing to keep in mind if we want to take into account uh, the fine lines of posterior cornea astigmatism
So we talked a little bit about imaging the backside of the cornea, and nothing does this better than um, cornea tomography. Uh, it, uh, the story here began with the scanning slit devices, uh, which were able through a uh, slit that was scanned of the cornea and videographed to give us uh, anterior and posterior elevation data and thus pachymetry. Uh, now these devices directly measure the elevation of both the anterior and posterior cornea via domain or light-based uh, analysis. And this is able to, um, to give us uh, anterior and posterior curvature in diopters as well as cornea thickness or pachymetry of microns. And as you can understand, this really brought a, a big turn in paradigm in um, cornea evaluation and anterior segment surgery. The most representative of the scanning slit devices is the ORP scan, which became popular in the early and mid uh, 1990s. Uh, and uh, the tomography devices followed almost a decade after that, with the most representative device here being the um, um, uh, Pentacam and the Visantive. Now let's talk a little bit about the scanning slit uh, or the orb scan. You can see a device uh, here photographed. You can also see the device in action using um, our uh, basically slit lamp uh, view of what we're all familiar with. And this just goes through uh, the cornea surface in the horizontal axis and is then analyzed to give us the maps that we're seeing on the right side. And these are the most representative uh, maps, uh, cornea power, from the uh, orb scan map on the right, on the top left, uh, the uh, anterior elevation on the bottom left, uh, cornea pachymetry on the top right, and posterior elevation on the bottom right. And then uh, underneath that, uh, maps B, C, D are just displayed differently. Um, and then uh, maps E and F show again the anterior posterior elevation. Um, and uh, again, Orb scan was the first one to offer us um, tomographic images. This is a typical orb scan readout. Um, now the anterior and posterior elevation are at the top. The uh, curtometric power uh, estimated by the devices on the bottom uh, left and the pachymetric map on the uh, bottom right. And the important things here, you can see all the data, the milieu of data represented here um, uh, in the middle column almost looks like a phone book and the most important data are the anterior and posterior elevation maps here we can pick up any significant differences and uh, elucidate on possible cornea pathology uh, the pachymetric map uh, simulated k which is the simulated uh, anterior keratometry by the device in a fashion similar to what a manual keratometer would read out uh, k max which is the maximum cornea power k min the minimum cornea power measured the characteristic data in three and five millimeter diameter. Again, here, white to white measurement, pupil diameter, AC depth, anterior chamber depth. Another very important new parameter now, anterior segment imaging, um, angle kappa and kappa intercept. And uh, uh, jumping now to sine fluke tomography, and we're seeing um, an image of a sine fluke measurement on the top right. And uh, these devices use a milieu of these sections that are uh, produced by a central beam projected onto the cornea from the device that we're seeing on the bottom uh, and then photographed from the sides of the device. Uh, and thus uh, uh, 24 to 50 slits are uh, photographed and analyzed and give us uh, numbers similar to what we saw before in the orb scan. Here the um, cornea topography in a sagittal form is viewed on the top left. The um, anterior elevation is on the top right, posterior elevation uh, on the bottom right, and cornea pachymetry on the bottom left. A uh, little bit uh, of a misnomer here. The uh, map reads sagittal curvature front, but in essence, it shows us the total cornea power. Uh, and again, on the numbers where we're seeing um, cornea front, uh, 41.6 and 43.2, these are the total cornea measurements. And unfortunately, up to the date, these have not been corrected by oculus. Uh, as we can see, there's under that uh, the cornea back numbers, which are minus... Uh, 5.9 and minus 6.5 in the two 
uh, characteristic meridians. Um, so uh, uh, for the uh, sake of not being confused, uh, instead of cornea front that the pentacam reads, the numbers shown are the total cornea power, and the cornea front would be obviously those numbers um, minus the minus numbers of the cornea back, uh, which would turn them into uh, numbers that are much higher, as we talked about before. So a picture of the pentacam here. This has become probably the most popular device globally uh, in evaluating corneas, and many people use interchangeably the, the term topography because it does give us topographic maps of the anterior um, cornea curvature, elevation back and front, and the cornea thickness. Uh, but I think we now have the knowledge of uh, knowing the difference between placido-based topography and uh, tomography measurements. Here's a typical uh, sine fluke tomography, uh, the pentacam. And uh, the reason I chose this example is uh, also uh, the fact that we're seeing that the astigmatic bow tie, the astigmatism here is not very high, 1.2 diopters. Uh, we can appreciate how it almost goes from uh, edge to edge of the cornea image here, which again is 9 millimeters in diameter. Uh, also, the cornea pachymetry here is very high. Uh, the average uh, for Caucasians is probably uh, 630, uh, where Asi in Asians uh, it might be uh, lower than that. And... Um, uh, an important factor here, uh, a little pearl here, is that in corneas that have very high cornea pachymetry, we need to also take into account the epithelial cell density, make sure that these are not corneas that are decompensated and thus are appearing thicker. Uh, another pearl here is that on the bottom uh, right of the picture, we can see uh, an IOP adjustment uh, algorithm where the device has uh, preempted data to calculate what the adjusted intraocular pressure would be in this eye due to the increased cornea thickness. So it gives us a minus 5.4, so 5.5 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury less of whatever we measured with applanation um, tonometry. So if we had measured 25, for instance, in the eye of this patient, the real pressure would be 19 and a half. And for decades now, we're almost in the second decade, it is um, automatic that we have, we evaluate a glaucoma patient. We are always, at least in the first measurements, need to take into account the cornea pachymetry and thus um, uh, translate the pressure that we're measuring to the accurate pressure of the eye. Obviously, when the cornea pachymetry is thicker, we would tend to err on being more aggressive in treating glaucoma. The big problem is the opposite. When the cornea pachymetry is much thinner, for instance, if this was a 430 microns cornea, the adjustment would be a plus 5 or plus 6 millimeters of mercury, and we could be all uh, be sitting comfortably reassuring the patient if we measured intraocular pressures of 18 and 17, but in essence, those pressures will be in the mid-high 20s, and very alarming, pointing out again, it's out of the scope of our discussion here today, that glaucoma assessment requires very careful optic nerve uh, evaluation optic nerve imaging, but cornea pachymetry is a very important factor here. Um, let's go and look at some of the classic maps. Uh, the axial map, we talked about this before, is basically uh, the map that's used more, more often. It is uh, measuring the cornea power or the actual curvature, and uh, these are probably the maps that we use the most uh, in all anterior segment surgery and cornea evaluations. Uh, also in the intraocular lens calculation. Um, we're seeing a simple example of uh, spherical cornea. You can see how the colors are hotter in the center and become a little bit cooler in the mid-periphery, uh, underlining the cornea sphericity that we mentioned before. Uh, in this uh, middle image, we can immediately appreciate uh, curvaconus as there is significant inferior steepening uh, in this eye. Uh, of course, uh, this shows us just the anterior cornea surface, and in order to establish the diagnosis of keratoconus, we have to make sure that no other pathology that can give the same image is into play here, for instance, uh, healing epithelial defect in that area, or other things that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And uh, uh, the tricky image of a very central 
steep cornea or a central cone or a nipple cone uh, is seen on the bottom picture. And unfortunately, this image will uh, go under the radar for most artificial intelligence placed into these devices to pick up cornea irregularity and flag keratoconus. So we have to be very uh, careful of judging these pictures. Again, if this was a placido-based uh, produced image, we would put a question mark on the validity of the cornea steepening shown here. Uh, but since this image is produced by a tomography, it is valid. Thus, uh, this shows a very steep cornea just centrally, and we should think central keratoconus until proven otherwise. Um, tangential maps, uh, these are the ones uh, uh, that uh, measure a point of data at a 90 degree tangent uh, from its surface. Uh, they provide more detailed description of the cornea shape and provide a clearer view of the size and shape of the cone in keratoconus. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, tangential maps, uh, we can define the position of the treatment or the effect of cornea reshaping or refractive surgery a little bit better, uh, but they are not the ones that are used more commonly. We're seeing examples of tangential maps on the right. Um, this is a refractive power map, uh, which uh, is uh, similar to the actual map that we saw before. And uh, we're seeing how uh, the map shows us the astigmatism that here is against the rule on the top right picture. And taken that the uh, projection mirrors are accurate, as we can see in the raw data, those uh, data become relatively valid and accurate. Um, elevation map, we talked about a little bit uh, before. Uh, the elevation map defines the height of the cornea and the reference or best fit sphere of the part of the cornea that has been imaged and then creates a plus and minus of the specific point of the cornea uh, measured towards that best fit sphere. So from the cornea image taken, uh, a best fit sphere is being defined by the device and then it goes spot to spot. And if that spot is, is more elevated than the best fit sphere, it has a plus denominator. If it's depressed, it has a minus denominator and thus the elevation maps. Um, uh, they uh, represent cornea height in microns, and they become very important uh, in um, depicting uh, irregularities, either in the front surface or the back surface of the eye, in picking up early uh, cornea anomalies, such as ectasia and keratoconus. Uh, we're uh, going to jump to the pachymetric map. I think uh, I alluded to its value before. Um, looking at these maps here, I want to underline that uh, despite of the amount of astigmatism, uh, cornea pachymetric maps will always change in circles that are concentric and with smooth transition. And this is what the Bell and Ambrosio formula, um, that is uh, a default measurement in most uh, pentacams available out there, uh, measures. It measures the gradient of cornea thickness change from the center to the periphery. And we see uh, in this example that the gradient flags as normal. But if we look at the maps, we can see um, where I'm describing the picture that is on the right, uh, the top picture on the right that shows us the Bell and Ambrosio of the two eyes of this patient, right eye and left eye. And we can see that the uh, measurement is the red line. And it, uh, it shows a normal gradient uh, from central to the periphery. Nevertheless, the change in color uh, in the thickness maps and the thickness, uh, minimal thickness being 465 microns should make us very suspicious in um, the fact that these corneas may not be normal. This may be a central keratoconus that is going uh, off the radar because of its uh, intrinsic distribution. Just as a pearl here, uh, central nipple cones account for only 50% of keratoconus eyes and usually in eyes that uh, show up as uh, progressive myopia and puberty. Thus, they're very often missed uh, until very late, until the cornea is thinned quite significantly. Uh, and I think this fact uh, underlines the importance of cornea uh, topography and tomography and, and screening in the healthy population for keratoconus, and especially in, uh, uh, in teenage years. Uh, we talked about this before. The uh, minimal cornea thickness here is 465 and 461, and the respective numbers in IOP adjustment are plus 5.5 and, 
and plus 5.9. In this case, I think it also underlines what I talked about before, the fact that um, thin corneas may throw us off in having full security of normal intraocular pressure measurement. Um, now I'm going to go to the pictures on the right, and you're seeing different distributions of cornea thickness. On the top row, the normal one is the central one. Cornea thickness usually changes in circles and has smooth transitions. So we're seeing only two or three colors in the pachymetry maps, where in the other two images on the side, we're seeing more than two colors showing somehow a steep transition from periphery to the center. Uh, although the, um, the uh, transition is in circle form and not in oval form. As in the images on the bottom left where we're seeing significant uh, thinning inferiorly, and here one may suspect um, a pellucid marginal degeneration as the cornea is very thin in its inferior periphery. Um, we're seeing a, a classic uh, keratoconic eye uh, in the third picture on the bottom row from the left. Uh, we can see how the cornea very steeply thins in um, an area that's not the center. Uh, the uh, oxymoron here is that the cone uh, or the thinnest part of the cone is inferonasal and not inferotemporal. We're looking at the right eye. And here, something that usually causes confusion, we can see uh, how the uh, topography takes a, um, uh, a crab-like uh, claw, crab claw appearance, which uh, in uh, historic terms makes us think of pellucid marginal degeneration, but the pachymetry maps exclude that. This is an oblique uh, cone with claw-like um, uh, topographic image, and we should be able to differentiate that because uh, pellucid uh, marginal degeneration and keratoconus have a different endemic age, and a different inheritance pattern, and probably a different treatment pattern as well. Uh, and on the two uh, bottom row right pictures, we can see a classic cone. Uh, the thinnest part of the cornea is temporally. We can see how the thickness maps have become oval. So we, can, uh, we have the uh, luxury by looking qualitatively at the thickness maps to see the irregularity in this cornea and how uh, the cone is evident on the topographic map. Now, on this particular case, the Bell and Ambrosio data that we saw in the image above would flag as uh, abnormal, even at the very early changes. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time uh, in uh, evaluating pachymetric maps, and I want to convey this message to you, obviously, because for me, they are the most important uh, measurement in elucidating of whether an eye has the suspicion of not of keratoconus, even at the very, very early stages. So of all the uh, representations of tomography, in my opinion, in my experience, and I see hundreds of topographies a day, this is the most important map of the cornea pachymetry. And also as a prelude of what we're going to talk about a little bit later, the bottom two left maps are produced by OCT. They are not uh, uh, sign fluke derived or scanning slit derived pachymetry images. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's go now and uh, look at some traditional screening uh, criteria for cornea irregularity, either if those are obtained with topography or tomography. Obviously, they were described initial for topographic measurements prior to what we talked about before, having the luxury of looking at pachymetry maps and posterior cornea curvature. Uh, obviously, the most important thing here is the asymmetric steepening criteria. And we're all alluding to ectasia and keratoconus. And a normal cornea is usually under 47.2 diopters. doesn't mean that everything over 47 diopters is abnormal, but our antennas of suspicion should be out and working. Uh, form first keratoconus that's described uh, by Amsler as keratoconus that never uh, blossomed, never progressed. So it's a term that can only be used after following a patient several years. Um, uh, an early keratoconic eye would be different. These terms, unfortunately, are used interchangeably today. Uh, many people describe this from Frust, uh, a very slight early keratoconic images, uh, is uh, a slighter, steeper denominator than that. And most people would agree that uh, over 48.7 diopters were probably talking about keratoconus. Remember that this uh, excludes eyes that have been steepened hydrogenically 
such as eyes that hyperopia has been treated with laser on the cornea. So uh, the index, uh, the Rabinovich McDowell index was very, very commonly used in the past. Uh, I think at the time it made a lot of sense and it was brilliant. Uh, and um, we can see the principles that that index used, central cornea steepening, uh, comparing uh, values uh, that are in the superior half of the cornea to the values that are in the inferior half of the cornea and the SRHA. Um, I will not elucidate in these a lot because most of these data are not done automatically by our uh, topographers and tomographers. Um, screening with elevation maps, we can see here several parameters, uh, changes in the elevation maps of uh, uh, over 20 microns uh, should be flagged in one's qualitative view of the uh, elevation maps of the cornea, either superior elevation maps or anterior elevation maps or uh, posterior elevation maps. So the key point here is that uh, if we're having elevation maps that have areas within them of more than 20 micron difference than the best fit sphere, this should be a factor to make us suspect of irregularity. And I think uh, we talked about the pachymetric maps. I talked about uh, the importance of a pachymetric map uh, for cornea detrugescence. Uh, this is, for instance, a map that we will measure uh, the uh, efficacy of a uh, endothelial graft, whether that is a DSEC or a DEMEC procedure in the way that the graft will detrugesce the total cornea. Remember that corneas uh, start to show clinical signs of uh, bullous keratopathy, if they go over 630, 640 microns. Uh, remember again that pachymetry map uh, relies very much of the time of the day that we're painting the maps. Everybody's corneas are a little bit more edematous when we wake up in the morning because uh, our cornea does not have the luxury of dehydrating fluid from its surface while we're sleeping. So um, in eyes that have borderline increase in the pachymetry, uh, the time where the maps were obtained and its distance from the time that the patient woke up um, is important in order to better elucidate uh, the importance of difference in pachymetry maps. For instance, we cannot compare in an early um, Fuchs and Lithial dystrophy patient maps that were taken, for instance, one day at 9 a.m. and another day at 6 p.m. because uh, that difference in pachymetry may be uh, just uh, an artifact from the time that was taken from the time the patient has woken up. We talked about the importance of pachymetry maps in the charcoal pressure measurement. We talked about the qualitative importance of how normal pachymetry maps, regardless of the amount of astigmatism, uh, change from periphery to center or center from periphery. The change is in circles and always in smooth transitions. The presence of a lot of colors, to say it a little bit more simplistically, within a pachymetric map should flag our attention uh, and we should be, start to become suspicious that this, uh, even if it's very symmetrical, may be a central or a nipple cone. Uh, and here uh, we have some of the more advanced uh, algorithms in picking up uh, ectasia or ectasia risk factors, the most popular one being from uh, uh, Dr. Rattleman, and we're seeing here the Rattleman Asia risk factor score system that is based on uh, uh, pachymetric uh, data, on age, on central cornea thickness, um, and on uh, refractive errors that were uh, used at the LASIK uh, correction. And uh, indices uh, such as the PTA index um, uh, below that, uh, measuring not just uh, cornea pachymetry and residual cornea pachymetry after LASIK, but the percent of tissue altered. I think it's very significant. We can't talk about residual cornea tissue left uh, in the same way in a cornea that started from 600 microns and a cornea that started from 510 microns. Obviously, there should be different criteria for, for the two edges of the bell curve of uh, normal cornea thickness. I won't stay in that uh, uh, in a lengthy way. Uh, now that we've learned a lot about topography and tomography, I want to surprise you with the images taken from the same cornea. This is the same uh, patient in all the images, a 48-year-old lady with uh, 
a problem that's relatively benign, uh, central cloudy dystrophy of Francois. It's mainly an examination uh, spectacle. Uh, we can see those little white opacities, uh, kind of croco like crocodile chagrin, present in the center of the cornea. The crocodile chagrin goes throughout the cornea periphery and it's not as densely white in its little clouds within the cornea. They're in mid-cornea stroma and they have no um, uh, they, they have no effect on the patient's visual quality, function, etc. But, as we're seeing here, they make some of our measuring devices uh, go a little bit off track. On the bottom uh, left image, we can see the topographic representation from Seinfeld imaging of this cornea, where, erroneously, it shows a significant depression centrally. Remember, we spoke about Seinfeld imaging taking sections of the cornea and measuring anterior posterior elevation, thickness, and curvature from these elevation data, but it does require the fact that the cornea image is clear and naive. So obviously the, these opacities not significant for the visual activity of the patient are significant enough to make our uh, Pendicam measure falsely this patient. And uh, in the middle we can see the uh, a placido-based topographer. Uh, obviously, it is more accurate in extrapolating the uh, curvature data. Uh, it is overreacting a little bit uh, in the um, infero uh, temporal meridian, where it shows significant steepening, and this is probably from dryness or the lashes that we see in the objective Myers over that. And this map shows us a little bit with the rule of astigmatism, but on the Cassini, which is we talked about before, is another reflection topography, but has more accurate central data, uh, it shows a little bit against the rule of astigmatism. And again, the reflection topography is not affected by, the, by these midstromal opacities. Obviously, this is a rare um, incident uh, of case. You may never see a case or may never recognize one because it may be very subtle. But I think this case underlines the significant differences that these uh, devices may have between them. And I think it acts as a good uh, point of reference for us to understand and value that not every topography map that we see is the same and that we have to take into account um, other uh, things that may be in play here. Um, and uh, hope you enjoyed that example. Again, this is a case, I did encounter this case uh, in my New York office, uh, whew, it's been a long time now, uh, uh, as a possible post-LASIK ectasia, and I was surprised to see that several uh, prominent anterior segment surgeons uh, throughout the nation had uh, uh, placed their uh, judgment on this being uh, post lasik ectasia because of the obvious signs of inferior uh, steepening, um, uh, cornea irregularity. It is very obvious, but let's go and track this picture in the way that we talked about before. Let's go and look what I pointed out as possibly being the most important measurement in tomography. Let's go to the thickness map and this is the bottom left image on the on this Pentacam map and we see that the thickness map shows uh, thinning of the cornea that is indeed abrupt but it's superior to the pupillary aperture and now if we correlate that to the cornea steepening abo above these two points are now respective to each other so the steepest part of the cornea represented here is not the thinnest part of the cornea. And let's go look at the elevation maps on the right. The anterior elevation or the front elevation shows a significant elevation in, just below the pupil, just below the pupillary aperture. Uh, and this corresponds with the uh, topography map, the sagittal curvature map seen on the top left. But the posterior elevation map is almost normal, showing that this irregularity uh, is probably present just on the anterior cornea surface. And investigating a little bit more, we found out that this patient had significant astigmatism. It was hyperopic. It was mixed astigmatism that was treated. And this is an iatrogenically eccentric cornea ablation by the laser. It is not ectasia. And this changes completely the way we would deal with a patient like this. And although uh, not at liberty to go in length with uh, the logistics of this case, but I think it very nice uh, underscores 
the importance that we should give at each given map before we jump to the conclusion. Um, topometric indices. This is present in some topographers, some placido-based topographers. It's present in most uh, sign flow to tomographers, and it's the ones represented in the red circle, uh, the ISV, IVA, uh, K1, uh, CX1, IHA, IHD, Armin, and uh, Keratoconus index with the Anza Krumai criteria. And uh, these are asymmetry indices uh, calculated from the anterior cornea curvature. And they're very helpful. We've worked a lot in the past and we published a lot on these. They're very helpful in the, um, determining the cornea regularity. And we've shown, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, that the IHD is the most important of these parameters. The index of height decentration basically measures through several steep parts of the cornea their symmetry to the opposite side of the cornea in regard to the vertex um, in steepness. So if there's asymmetric steepening in the cornea, the IHD would increase over uh, 0 0.018, which is the norm. In keratoconus, it can go over to 0 0.200s and 300s. And this is a very good parameter in measuring keratoconus, with just one exception, central cones, because by definition, there, there may be symmetry compared to the vertex to uh, steepening of the cornea. The ISV is the second most important, in my opinion, is this index of surface variance. And this measures the difference between the steepest and the flattest keratometry measured by the device. And this, again, is able to tell us if the cornea is changing from what it should. The ISV should be under uh, 20 in most eyes. An increase in ISV obviously will follow an increase in the IHD, with the only exception in the central cone that will be picked up more. Um, uh, actually better uh, described as earlier by the ISV increase rather than the IHD increase. So I wanted uh, to briefly go through these and this is an example. Let's look at the topometric indices between the two eyes of a patient who has obviously advanced keratoconus in his right eye. The Amsler Krumai criteria on the topometric indices is already up to two. Those go all the way up to four and they're a good um, number to uh, evaluate it and, uh, and also titrate the amount of keratoconus an eye has. We can see that the IHD is not very high. It's 0 0.29 in regards to the degree of keratoconus uh, present here. And why is that? We talked about before because this is a mainly central cone. And this is flagged more uh, with the ISV in this eye. It's gone all the way up to 60, along with the other topometric indices that are also quite important, but in my opinion, the most important being the um, IHD. Now, interestingly enough, in the right eye, uh, significant keratoconus. In the left eye, the device with our AI reads uh, no keratoconus. But if we look carefully at the image, we can see there's inferior steepening. Uh, the IHD is borderline increased. The ISV is still normal. And what is it that you want to see next? And I want to hear here that you want to see the pachymetry maps in this eye. And uh, that would be obviously the referee in uh, whether this eye has expressed keratoconus or not. Uh, I often hear colleagues talking about the healthy other eye of a keratoconus patient. Obviously, that's a misnomer. If the um, biomechanical uh, ingredients uh, of an eye uh, where to develop keratoconus, and this is not hydrogenic or from trauma. Uh, and remember, this could even be at birth. Uh, birth with forceps delivery can split decimates and can predispose this patient to undergo uh, changes that will result in keratoconus. We've published on this in the past. Um, both eyes, if not uh, through trauma uh, or uh, hydrogenic intervention, will hold similar biomechanical properties and thus uh, we should, in my opinion, uh, use the term unexpressed keratoconus or from first keratoconus for the left eye of this patient rather than uh, the other normal eye of, of a keratoconic patient. So these are the Amsler krumai classification uh, criteria, stage one, uh, two, three, and four. And these are the numbers that uh, our Pentacam 
or corneal tomography devices are looking for in order to flag uh, the result. Uh, I'm not going to go into depth. Uh, you can um, study and use them as a reference. Um, the, this, these are other devices you're measuring pachymetry. And uh, this particular one, the high-frequency ultrasound, has uh, been developed uh, across town in New York City, uh, specifically at the Cornell Lab. And we can see the high-frequency ultrasound can, uh, and uh, it has reached the point of a commercially available device, can measure through accurate uh, ultrasound measurements uh, the thickness of the cornea and give us maps of uh, the stroma, the epithelium, and the total cornea based on the reflectivity that the uh, interfaces between these uh, principles will have between them. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on high-frequency ultrasound, but I think uh, in uh, uh, cornea diagnostics evaluation, one at least has to be familiar with them. Here we're seeing uh, a LASIK eye and how the device can even pick up a flap depth uh, in the device because the uh, old LASIK flap interface flags with uh, reflectivity for this device and thus can give us uh, uh, data on the co total cornea thickness, the epithelial thickness, and the actual flap thickness. Uh, brilliant technology. Unfortunately, a little bit difficult to use because it does require a water bath for the eye. So the patient has to dip their eye within a water bath and all of the logistical difficulties that this entails and also very uh, astute and experienced examiner to uh, give the data. We published in the past um, work on using this and evaluating uh, three different types of flaps with LASIK, one with a manual keratome and two different types of femtosecond lasers and the representative flap uh, uh, obtained with each one of these devices is shown here on the right uh, row images with the um, uh, top being the keratome, uh, the middle being um, uh, one femtosecond laser and the bottom being another and we can see that in an average of eyes, there can be differences. And it's brilliant that we have technology that can um, deline uh, or delineate those differences. Uh, we also use this device to point out that uh, when we are evaluating cornea epithelial thickness, uh, even prior to obtaining significant cornea epithelial thickness irregularities in the cornea that may suggest early keratoconus, the average epithelial thickness of keratoconic or pre-keratoconic eyes increases. And we call this uh, uh, reactive epithelial hypertrophy. And we uh, speculated that this may correlate uh, the change in biomechanics in um, those eyes that uh, through the uh, saccadic eye movement or even the blood pulse movement of the cornea uh, makes the epithelium react and become thicker. So, for instance, in the healthy, quote-unquote, or from first keratoconic eye, other eye of a patient who has keratoconus, uh, we feel, and we've reported on this, that a significant increase of the epithelial thickness in that eye may suggest that the eye is biomechanically unstable and that may require closer monitoring because if it spills over into ectasia, measurements to contain it need to be taken, such as stop by rubbing and uh, potentially employ cornea cross-linking. Uh, not really the subject of this discussion. We'll talk about a little bit in another discussion about uh, keratoconus diagnosis, but these are the data from the, state, uh, the study published in 2011. We can see in the top right image uh, normal eyes uh, and their epithelial thickness distribution, uh, keratoconic eyes uh, that are not treated with cross-linking, we can see that the thickness is, is much higher in uh, keratoconic eyes that were treated with cross-linking. Not only did the epithelial average thickness decrease and reach normal, but it went under normal, uh, thus underlining the point that I made before. And uh, I will close uh, this uh, discussion on advanced uh, cornea imaging with uh, something that I alluded to before. Uh, these are pachymetry maps produced now by anterior segment OCT. They obviously uh, copy or follow the paradigm uh, drawn by the high-frequency ultrasound with the difference of the uh, significant ease of obtaining these maps. Uh, they do not require a, a water bath for the patient. They're, they're very easy to obtain. Um, they do not depend on the examiner 
expertise as much. And uh, we're seeing here that these devices can give us a total thickness map. It's the map on the left and a epithelial thickness map, the map on the right. Uh, and we've worked uh, on that uh, significantly in the past. We've uh, reported on this type of technology, uh, what is normal. And we found to our surprise that uh, by using it here, segment OCT, cornea epithelial thickness is probably the most stable parameter in the tumor in the eye. It's kind of a similar parameter to the uh, body core temperature being 36.8 degrees Celsius in most people throughout the world, regardless of age, uh, sex, uh, geographic location. Same with the cornea epithelial thickness. In all cases, evaluated regardless of age, refractive error, um, and sex, uh, we found that the epithelial thickness is, is remarkably consistent, that magic number being 51 to 52 microns. You can see here on this graph how, and this is from a publication in uh, the Journal of Cornea, how little deviation there is between central cornea, superior, inferior, minimum, and maximum. And uh, uh, this, again, um, is uh, a, a publication that followed in looking at some of the clinical signs with using the similar technology and uh, identifying and titrating dry eye. And we're seeing here uh, images, uh, top bottom left, the normal eye, uh, actually uh, top uh, uh, left and right, a normal eye, total cornea thickness and uh, epithelial thickness. And on the bottom left and right, uh, left uh, total cornea thickness in a dry eye patient. Uh, and this is where we define the cr criteria that through epithelial thickness, we can flag the eyes that have uh, dry eye despite all the other principles that we have and potentially uh, evaluate and follow up our treatment for dry and or buffaritis. And again, looking at epithelial thickness and how total cornea thickness may change uh, after cataract surgery. And the remarkable thing here is that it may take uh, uh, six months to a year for cornea thickness to reach uh, uh, a preoperative level and epithelial uh, remodeling to subside. We can see how the epithelium, uh, this is the second uh, row in the images of the publication of general refractive surgery, at a week's time has, uh, has such a, a tremendous response and tremendous uh, remodeling making our uh, eye measurements at the week interval uh, becoming extremely inaccurate. And I, I uh, think that this picture and these pictures rather underline the best uh, the time interval that we need in order to establish stable, accurate, accurate and reproducible measurements uh, post cataract surgery. And these are some pachymetric criteria that we reported um, in um, using anterior segment OCT and comparing supranasal to inferior temporal on the left picture and superior to inferior uh, as we have shown that anterior segment OCT is far more accurate in measuring cornea thickness and thus these uh, parameters do uh, carry a more significant weight in us uh, screening for keratoconus very early and uh, this is uh, the normal. Now uh, I want to show you some examples of anterior segment OCT imaging uh, in a nine millimeter diameter, and this is an evolution of an obviously anterior segment OCTs, total cornea thickness on the top row, epithelial thickness on the bottom row, um, right and left eye respectively. And we can see how after refractive surgery, and these are uh, post uh, PRK eyes, uh, cornea epithelial remodeling can be very robust. And this has to be taken into account before we um, make uh, conclusions on uh, refractive change, uh, recurrence of myopia, recurrence of astigmatism, whether the eye is dry or not, etc., etc. And this is a whole new world of evaluating uh, visual function, refraction, and postoperative course of refractive surgery patient having the ability to look at the uh, anterior segment OCT epithelial maps. They're easy to obtain and obviously a very significant tool in today's uh, evaluation of patients. Again, uh, this is another example where uh, the patient claimed that they had taken off contact lenses for two weeks prior to, for instance, their LASIK consultation. But on evaluation today, we're seeing that the epithelial maps are regular. Uh, the average epithelial thickness is uh, 
46, making it very thin. Uh, there's a lot of irregularity, and this is consistent with contact lens abuse. So uh, by looking at the maps, number one, a refraction may not be accurate taken today. Number two, um, we may uh, ask the patient to stay, uh, really stay off contact lenses in order to have a more accurate refraction measurement and better representation in these images. And again, uh, let's look at some examples that will help us uh, highlight what we talked about before. This is a uh, patient that was referred to me for actually treatment with uh, cross-linking. Uh, Dr. K, uh, please treat this patient. I've evaluated this patient with progressive corneoctasia. And obviously, these maps suggest that it's so. The significant uh, truncation and steepening here in the central cornea. Our pachymetry maps are irregular. We talked about pachymetry, in my opinion, being the most important denominator here. The cornea thins significantly and very steeply in the center. Uh, the elevation maps, though, here are not going along with the curvature maps, nor is the posterior elevation map uh, correlating well with the total pachymetry map on sine flu. This is the Cassini reflection topography, similar to what a placido disc topography will show. Um, this is a right eye, so infratemporal steepening. Uh, but if we look at the anterior segment OCT, we can see the total thickness may show a little bit of thickening of the cornea uh, in, uh, just off the center. But it really changes the way we're viewing this eye because it shows that all the irregularity that we're seeing is on the epithelium. There's a significant hypertrophic epithelial island here, and it's difficult to see at this picture, but it, it correlates with this band of whitish, very subtle, um, uh, for obviously this picture does not do it justice, uh, of a whitish um, area uh, where the epithelial has thickened. And this is a rare um, finding in cornea. It's a band world-like anterior basement membrane dystrophy. It's a, it is an autosomal dominant problem that it, in this particular patient could have caused the patient having had uh, cross-linking for a reason that uh, we now, in hindsight, see that is not there. Uh, the cornea is thick. There's no uh, cornea thinning. Uh, the steepening is an artifact from the epithelial hypertrophy. Uh, this uh, image could resemble the image that we will obtain uh, from a sloppy intraocular pressure measurement with a Goldman applinator. I've seen eyes that were um, measured uh, without the Goldman applinator being dried off from uh, the use of alcohol, and that may produce a similar artifact. So again, uh, I'm going to go back to uh, the fact that we talked about before. Topographies have to be uh, correlated with the device that have obtained the topography and the specific parameters that may be or may not be accurate in the specific device. Again, uh, this is, uh, we talked about this a little bit before. This is an eye with very high astigmatism. It's reading uh, over two diopters. We can see it in the uh, sagittal uh, curvature map on the top left of the pentacam. And look how the pachymetry maps uh, are very smooth. We're essentially seeing two colors. Um, of pachymetry change in the periphery in the center of the cornea. Fine. For those of you who are looking at the uh, pachymetry maps on the pentagon, a little bit oval and skewed uh, infratemporally, uh, the referee that comes into play here with the anterior segment of CT shows us the pachymetry map is absolutely symmetric and it has very smooth transition from periphery to center. Uh, the elevation maps on the uh, this right eye um, front and back also are naive, uh, thus um, establishing, underlining what I talked about before of the high astigmatism uh, not correlating with change in the pachymetry. There's another example how a very steep cornea does not necessarily mean that the cornea is thin. Uh, this is a, a, a patient who's at the end of the curve uh, based on the uh, Rabinovich uh, McDowell uh, criteria, this would be from first keratoconus having an average keratometry of uh, uh, over uh, 47 diopters and the steepest being 48. Um, and uh, we can see though that the pachymetry maps reassure us that this is a cornea that is much thicker than normal. 
uh, again, if we paid attention to this talk earlier, the little piece of the puzzle that's missing here is uh, an idea of the endothelial function of this patient, whether the endothelial cells are normal. So in any cornea that's over 600 microns in central cornea thickness, at least in my clinical practice, I do like to see uh, an endothelial cell density to establish that this is not a product of endothelial decompensation. Uh, the endothelial uh, cell density here was normal. So this is, uh, a, of course, a rare case with very steep corneas that are at the same time very uh, thick. And uh, on the right side, we're seeing that cornea pachymetry numbers are now available with some of the interferometry devices that we use. Um, and this also establishes uh, uh, the central cornea pachymetry being uh, 561 uh, and 567 in this patient with intraocular pressure adjustment of uh, minus 2.5. So these are uh, some of the basic principles I wanted to discuss with you. Um, it's a lot of material. It's uh, work, uh, in my personal experience, over the last uh, three decades. Um, I know this is a very short interval uh, to discuss and point out uh, most of the fruitful things that you can obtain from uh, cornea imaging, but I hope uh, this uh, review may help you better understand uh, the principles involved and make you better clinicians uh, in evaluating normal uh, refractive surgery candidates and potential early TASIA eyes. Uh, this is John Canalopoulos. I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Thanks so much.